Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is John Lenchowski. I'm president of the Institute. I'd like to welcome you all here. Uh, I am just delighted that we are able to host uh, one of the most important people in the nation when it comes to the analysis of, uh, of uh, Chinese strategy and what U.S. strategy ought to be in light of the U.S.-China relationship. Um, for those of you who are new to the Institute, you should realize that we sound like a think tank, but we are in fact a, an independent graduate school of international affairs and national security. We have five master's degree programs. Uh, we have a, the, a, a doctoral program, which is the first in the nation. It's a professional doctoral program in national security. Uh, we specialize in teaching all of the different arts of statecraft, by which we mean the instruments of national power and how they are and ought to be integrated in national strategy. Um, so I, you should be aware, for those of you who are new, that um, there are, we have great flexibility in our, in our curriculum and one can even come here and take a single course without committing to an entire semester's uh, worth of tuition uh, and we try to accommodate the needs of working professionals uh, who are in the many businesses we cover uh, a good half of our students fit into that category. Um, Rob Spaulding is, uh, is, as I said, one of the most important people in the whole field of U.S.-China relations in this country. He has um, he recently retired from the U.S. Air Force at the rank of Brigadier General. Uh, he served there for 26 years. Uh, his last post uh, was serving in the National Security Council as Director for Strategic Planning, uh, and he was the Chief Architect of the National Security Strategy of the United States. Uh, he was the, uh, formerly the Chief China Strategist, uh, strategist for the Chairman of the, uh, of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and uh, he was also, he served as our defense attaché in China. Uh, he earned his doctorate in economics and mathematics from the University of Missouri. He's fluent in Mandarin. He has written a new book called Stealth War, How China Took Over While America's Elite Slept. Uh, it is an extremely important book. And I'd like to welcome Rob to the podium so that uh, he can share his wisdom with you all. Thank you. Thanks so much, John. John was uh, very helpful while I was at the White House in, in helping educate me on kind of the history of the U.S. Information Agency and what the Reagan administration did with uh, public diplomacy. And unfortunately, I was not able to uh, get a lot of his recommendations in because we have this enormous thing called a bureaucracy. It's like a large ship with a very small rudder. But um, nevertheless, he's made a great impression, uh, not just on um, you know national security for the United States, but on his students here at the Institute for World Politics. So and I'm very excited to be here speaking at IWP. I, um, the book itself, uh, I hope you have a chance to read it because uh, the, I really uh, think that the national security strategy that the United States put out in December of 2017 is really fundamentally different from uh, any strategy we put out for several decades. Uh, but uh, what it fails um, in is that we don't have a good background and context for that. So the book is really about providing background and context for the national security strategy. Uh, it's an, essentially an executive summary of all the work that went into, a lot of the work that went into identifying what are the challenges that we face in a globalized and internet connected world, um, how we define national security in the 21st century, and what we ought to do about it. Um, I think today what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about some of the underlying assumptions and, um, and really have a back and forth with you because 
I know for some of you that might have read the book, you may have some questions or you may just have questions that you're curious about what's in the media today because quite frankly, the media doesn't do a very good job of talking about what the government is doing in, in terms of all these things. So what is the government doing to implement the national security strategy uh, from the media that you watch every single day? You would get the impression that we're not doing anything. Of course, I just got back from Berlin uh, and Brussels and Poland, and I would say that um, quite the opposite. Europe is waking up to the challenge of uh, to democracy that um, the uh, what they would say, what the Europeans would say, the number three economy, because the EU is number two um, economy in the world, is, um, or maybe even number one. I, I don't know what the I don't know what the uh, representative numbers are between the EU and the United States. But anyway, that um, it presents a challenge to democracy, and, and I think uh, the the recent episode with the NBA is is was such a, a strong reminder of the challenges we face in these economic and financial connections that we've created uh, with globalization and the internet. So, first of all, when I talk about China, when I say the word China, or when I talk about the Chinese people, um, you have to understand that if it's something related to um, things that I find um, actually unpalatable with regard to human rights, civil liberties, democratic principles, or rule of law, I'm referring to uh, the Chinese Communist Party. And in the book, I quite clearly state that, you know, the challenge we have is not with China, uh, it's not with the Chinese people, it's not with the culture and history, the wonderful things that um, that I was experiencing when I lived there from 2002 to 2004 with my family, and quite frankly had a wonderful time and, and loved every minute of it, of it and got to know a lot of great Chinese people. Uh, we're talking about a regime that is, um, is fundamentally different than uh, quite frankly, any totalitarian regime that's ever existed on Earth. Um, and, uh, and I'll go into a little bit of why. Where This started, quite frankly, this, this journey to a national security strategy in December of 2017 did not start uh, in the first year of the Trump administration. It actually started in the Obama administration. It started with a small team uh, in the Pentagon working on China and trying to understand what are the challenges we face with regard to China. And it started out just in looking at, you know, how do we, uh, how do we continue to balance this enormous uh, weaponry we see growing on one side of the strait and we don't see a, um, a, uh, something countering that. And so, you know, I had two um, charts in my office at the Pentagon. One of them was just this growing um, size and scale of the weaponry that the Chinese Communist Party was putting out. And then the blue, uh, the red was the red, and then the blue was uh, what the U.S. Uh, could bring to, to bear against that. Now, I always argued at the time that it wasn't just the U.S. that was going to bring to bear um, tools against that. It was also our allies and partners. But still, even with that, uh, it was quite dwarfed by what the Chinese were producing. And so, you know, I started looking at what are the... What are the um, what is driving the ability to pump pump out a ship every six six weeks? You know, airplanes uh, at the cyclic rate, uh, and how do we how do we compete with that? You know, when mass brings a brings a power all of all its own. Even if we have advanced technological capability, we still have a challenge with meet, with meeting mass. It's much quite frankly much like the challenge we had in meeting the Soviets in the fold the gap uh, during the Cold War. And the other chart I had was the two relative um, gross domestic products for China and the U.S. overlaid. One was vertical and the other was horizontal. And, and coming to terms with, okay, growing weaponry and we've got two diverging uh, uh, growth models uh, for two separate countries. And um, looking around the space, whether it be in, in, in the political scene or whether it be in Wall Street or whether it be in corporate America, and the belief that essentially America was on the decline and China was um, going to be the dominant uh, country in the world. And it was quite frankly um, uh, hard to understand how we were going to preserve our uh, democracy in a world that was dominated by a totalitarian regime. And so it was really looking at um, not, it started out looking at the uh, industrial uh, base of the United States. You know, how do we how do we um, account for how we manufacture the things that protect us? You know, can we manufacture uh, the planes and the ships and the tanks and the subs that, we, and the and the and the 
truth of the matter is that we could manufacture a good portion of it, but uh, a lot of it we relied on the Chinese to manufacture for us. And so, you know, looking at the weaponry and then, then, then understanding from an industrial-based perspective, you know, we were relying on what we considered to be a potential adversary. Of course, at the time, we wouldn't call it an adversary. Um, and we still, uh, it seems in the Defense Department, have challenges um, uh, calling out what, um, what the Chinese Communist Party, by the way, would say themselves uh, when they're behind closed doors is that, you know, we are an adversary. And so this, by the way, um, also as we work from 2014 to 2015 to 2016, and we're coming into the 2016 campaign, and we're, we're looking at um, the challenges we face from a national security perspective. And you start to see these two candidates that come kind of out of nowhere, uh, both on the right and the left. And, and I'm talking about uh, Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders. And you're, and you're trying to make sense of what's going on in our society. And then why is that looking a lot like what I'm seeing in national security? Right? How are the angst? that's playing out in, in America being mirrored by the challenges I see in, in, in national security. So you start to look at, you know, in 2001 when China entered the WTO, before that, they had an economy less than one trillion GDP, one trillion dollars in gross domestic product. And you know, prior to that, every single year in our Congress, we had a vote on whether to allow, to grant China most favored nation trading status. Now, what went into that vote? Was it just about, you know, um, would China have a market-based economy? Clearly it did not. No, it was also about what was their human rights record? What were their democratic principles record? And of course, the business community didn't really like that. Why are we talking about human rights and democratic principles and rule of law and all of those things? How do they relate to you know, us trying to sell products to 1.4 billion Chinese or us trying to offload our manufacturing cap capability uh, to China so that we can increase our, uh, our margins because uh, they, have less, um, they have less environmental standards or labor standards. In other words, we can pollute all we want, we can exploit the labor, we can, we can boost our mar margins, we can turn around and sell things much cheaper in the United States. Sounds like a great deal, right? That's economics. It is uh, open markets lead to wealth, right? And a market-based system, uh, by definition, is Pareto optimal, which means that, you know, if you make bicycles and I grow corn, and you're good at that and I'm good at what I do, then we should trade because we, we're both going to be better off rather than me trying to make bicycles, you know, when I'm really good at, at growing corn. Well, that, um, when, you, when you think about the... the the international order that we created after the end of World War II, you know, free trade was part of it, but it's only a, it was only I would say half of it, half of the solution. The other half was about promoting democratic principles. So if you go to the Atlantic Charter and you look at, you know, what are kind of the four uh, pillars of the international order that Winston Churchill and FDR were were seeking to um, create after uh, that conflagration. It was democratic principles, free trade, rule of law, and self-determination. And here we had moved away from three of those, ostensibly for free trade, but in reality we didn't have free trade either because China wasn't a market-based economy. So what we saw after uh, China enters the WTO and that most favored nation vote goes away, not only are we not pressuring China on human rights and civil liberties and democratic principles, we're seeing the complete destruction of our, uh, of our manufacturing capacity. So over 70,000 factories between 2001 and 2017 in the United States disappeared. 3.4 million manufacturing jobs, four support jobs for each of those, over 13 million jobs gone. And so uh, we can't, we have to rely on Chinese companies to manufacture circuit boards for F-35s and at the same time, these people that had jobs, long-term jobs that came with health benefits and retirement benefits, are suffering. So you, you begin to see, and, and, and as I watched this play out, I said, this is very interesting. You know, 
I and so I I made a, a comment to um, to my colleagues at the Pentagon at the time. I said, I think this this Trump guy is going to win. And um, and they all laughed, and of course we all shared a chuckle because, quite frankly, it seemed um, odd at the time. But again, I kept coming back to the fact that everything that we were laying out in terms of what we needed to do as a country for our national security was coming out in the talking points that uh, that were coming out of that campaign. And then, of course, in November when he did win, I got a lot of emails from my from my colleagues that said, "Wow, how did you know?" And I said, "Well." Um, I mean, it's what we see in the, in the system. You know, we're broken as a nation. We're broken both in terms of national security, but we're also broken in our society. And if you think about it, if you go in, if you delve deeply into it, you begin to understand that that's precisely what the Chinese Communist Party seeks to do. They seek to erode democracies from within. And they have the power now with globalization and the internet to be able to do that. So... How does that play out? How do, how do you effectively take control of a society from within? Well, um, if you go back to 2016, within, I think, four days after the election, 25,000 people march up to Trump Tower in New York City. And uh, it was led by a group um, on Facebook called Black Lives Matter. And uh, what we found out subsequently is Big data analysis, AI bots, and social media, uh, the capability that the Russians had to influence our own population to protest, and quite frankly, they don't do it just in the United States, they do it everywhere. It's called atomization and is their, um, is their preferred method of influence that we had built in our society the tools to, that allowed them to do that. And and really anybody can do that now. So you're seeing this stuff play out, um, not just in America, it's all in democracies all over the world. So there's this, there's this um, I keep reading about it, this, this idea about rise of populism. It's actually, you know, and I write about this in the book, it's, it's actually the Constitution working. It's the American people standing up and saying, there's something wrong. I have, this, I, have this, um, I, have, I have this unspecified anxiety and I don't know what it is, but I can clearly see that you know, um, things are not going right. So let's go to 2007 when the iPhone comes out. iPhone comes out December of 2007. If you go back to 2007, the top five in the United States in market cap were AT&T, General Electric, Microsoft, ExxonMobil, and Shell. So when, if you remember, uh, as I do, when the iPhone came out, um, Steve Ballmer, the, the, the CEO of Microsoft, said, what are you going to do with that? And what Steve Jobs had in mind was, I'm going to change the world. And so you fast forward 10 years from 2007, and the top five in market cap in the United States are Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google. Like, we know this world today. But 10 years prior to that, we, there was a completely different world. Of course, we had already started shipping factories out, out to China uh, by 2007, but it was, it was accelerating. And we were chain our our society was changing from within. So a society, quite frankly, that we had built during the Cold War, it was being systematic, systematically dismantled, and it was being dismantled on the basis of two theories: an economic theory and a social theory. Economic theory says open markets lead to wealth. Social theory, the theory of modern modernization, says wealth leads to democracy. And so, all we needed to do was open up. And the world would democratize. And clearly, you know, the, the, that's one of the things that the national security strategy says quite clearly. That's not the case. Actually, you have to make a conservative effort to promote democratic principles and in conjunction with democratic allies and partners. So last week we had a vote at the UN. 54 countries sided with uh, China on human rights. And I think 32 sh sided with the United States. So John uh, in his school talks about um, power, right, national power. Well, one, one way of looking at the outcome of national power is to check, to pull some of these votes at the UN, right? If you can't pass a vote that actually supports democratic principles and human rights, then there's something going on. And, you know, often people would come to my office in the White House and say, 
uh, and sit down on my couch. I had a nice couch. Uh, I'm pretty proud about that. Uh, and today, you know, I want to talk to you about the liberal democratic order. You know, it's always about, you guys have it completely wrong. And I said, okay, please tell me about the liberal, liberal democratic order. In the summer of 17, for the first time, the EU votes against sanctioning China at the UN for human rights violations. So here's a democratic multilateral institution with a lot of NATO partners that just side, sided with a totalitarian regime. So explain to me how the liberal democratic order exists, because the liberal democratic order Go back to Atlantic Charter, democratic principles, human or uh, a rule of law, uh, free trade, and um, self determination. That's what I would consider the liberal. That's the values the liberal democratic order is supposed to promote. That's not promoting any of those. And so um, clearly, we need we needed things to do, and um, we had things to do as a nation. And so, what does the national security strategy attempt to do? It attempts to, first of all, put those two things back together, democratic principles and free trade. Now, how does that look in, in, uh, in context of things that we've done in the past? Where well, it really looks like the, you know, what it was like during the Cold War. We didn't trade with totalitarian regimes. Why? Because the innovation, the technology, the talent, and the capital, America has 40% of the investable capital in the world, we're supposed to go into driving the economic growth in the societies of, democrat, of democracies, not into growing the Soviet Union and, and everything that was behind the Iron Curtain. And it actually worked quite well. So as we were looking at this in the Pentagon, we're saying, well, okay, so um, the competition with the Soviet Union was not about military power. Right? We're in a bipolar world. Clearly, we, we focus on nuclear weapons. But our strategy was not to um, necessarily spend all our money on guns. You remember the guns and butter argument you learned in economics? Eisenhower's strategy was to spend our money on butter. And the Soviets spent their money on guns. Infrastructure, industrial base, STEM education, research and development. So as we looked at the elements of the competition, you see, okay, well, who's spending on those things now? It's not the United States. It's China, right? So we'd gotten ourselves not only in this military imbalance in, in the Pacific, we'd also gotten ourselves into a position where we no longer actually invested in the country. We no longer invested in our people. And so the, the national security strategy said, okay, let's put these principles back together. Let's start trading uh, with democracies again, and let's start protecting each of, our, um, each of our institutions of globalization, finance, trade, investment, immigration, media, politics, the internet, academia, Let's recognize that there's challenges that they face for, um, for promoting democratic principles in those institutions and supporting um, a growing, healthy society in the United States and other democracies. And let's figure out what are ways to, to, to solve some of those problems. So CFIUS reform, tariffs, um, FARA, um, focus on, um, on uh, Department of Justice and FBI going after the Ministry of State Security, going around our country, uh, doing force rendition and other things. All of these things, the, the, the State Department beginning to, to um, forcefully look at visas coming out of China for, you know, what are those people uh, coming here to do? All of these things are things that are going on in our government right now. And they were all put in place by the National Security Strategy as a plan to protect. I think the things that, that quite frankly, that still need to be done, really talk about investing in our nation. So investing in, um, in education. So when you think about national security in the context of the Middle East, let's take Afghanistan as an example. So we, just, we did this one exercise while I was at the White House. I asked some of the people that worked for me to look at what could we, what are 10 things we could do with the money, with the 40 to $60 billion a year we're spending in Afghanistan? I'll tell you what we can do. We could put 200,000 American kids through four years of STEM degree education. In five years, we could train a million engineers and scientists that are American, right? Kids that don't otherwise don't have the money to go to school. By the way, we did this during the space race. And so when we talk about what, where we're spending our money for national security, we have to recognize that there are trade-offs. And we can spend money to break things, or we can spend money to build things. We can spend money to train people how to kick down doors and shoot people, or we can spend money to train people how to build things. We've done both, 
And I think um, the, the record will show that we were far more successful when we were building. When we were focused on the military as a deterrent, not as something that needed to be actively used um, all around the world at all times. So our, our defense budget is about $100 billion a year. And I think you don't, you don't see where that money is not going, although the American people feel it. So Eisenhower National High, Highway System built during the Cold War. Now we're $5 trillion in arrears in infrastructure. Industrial base. I just talked about all the factories we lost and all the jobs we lost. STEM education. My son graduated uh, university two years ago in computer science. He was the only one in his uh, major, which was computer science, uh, that was American. All the rest were Chinese. In research and development, we're spending less than 0.7% of GDP. Most of that goes to the National Institute of Health, and most of that goes to China. In the 60s, we we're spending 2% of GDP. So when you think about national security, think it's more than um, a Ford class carrier. It's more than an F-35. It is how you are investing in your country and how you're protecting against um, globalization and the internet. And then the internet's a final piece. So let's go back to 2007. We went from Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google, or from uh, the five to the fangs. So China, what do they see? So the U.S. was the first to build a smartphone. That's a platform for the mobile, uh, mobile uh, world. And then the pipe, 4G network. We were the second country in the world to build a 4G network. Put the two together, and um, what you had is the ability to build the app services and business models that give us companies like Uber and Airbnb and WeWork. Right? So what do the Chinese Communist Party see? They say, ah, that's brilliant. So we're going to take it as a national strategic initiative to build that system. So Huawei and ZTE are going to build the platform. So now, what is 5G? In 5G, the smartphone kind of fades into the background, right? The things that you use a smartphone today, a lot of that's going to be wired in the city around you. Let me give you an example. You walk outside IWP uh, when this is over in the 5G world, and you say, I want an Uber, and a camera picks you up picks up your face, reads your lips, microphone picks up, you want an Uber, send you an Uber. All right, you get in, you go wherever you want. Convenient, right? Nice. Who owns that data? Okay, so when I wrote the, the, the 5G report that was leaked to the media, to buy, you know, quite frankly, by um, a lot of the uh, industry in, in this uh, country that didn't want to see um, Americans' data protected. What I was focused on is that. Who owns that data? Okay, so two weeks ago, uh, the Australian Strategic Policy uh, Institute, a researcher named Samantha Hoffman, came up with a, a, a nice paper called uh, Engineering Global Consensus. And it really is just a report on one company in China, Global Tone Communications Company, Corporation, GTCom for short. And what is GTCom? GTCom is a big data and AI company. What does GTCom do? They do translation in 65 languages. Who is GTCom owned by? Oh, by the way, they partner with Huawei. So Bill, they, their product is, is featured in some Huawei products that are sold on the market. So in addition to providing translation services for, for, um, for uh, revenue, what else does GTCom do? Well, GTCom is actually jointly owned by the Ministry of Finance and the um, propaganda arm of the Chinese Communist Party. And GT, GTCom, as its business model, collects two to three petabytes of data a year. Where do you think that data goes? It goes to the, chain, the propaganda arm of the Chinese Communist Party and the intelligence arm of the PLA. Okay, so what China saw back in 1999 was a convergence of this technology layer and business layer to the point where you could use it to not just using social credit score in China control populations, but as we've seen with what's going on with the NBA, by having access to the data and controlling the companies that dominate that sphere, you know, through the app services and business models begin to influence that population. What did TikTok just say at Congress? We were forced to censor according to Chinese Communist Party rules, right? Former employees. That's the world China wants to build. 
that's the world that we, quite frankly, gave them the innovation, technology, talent, and capital to build. Capital. There's a good one. Every good economist knows that investment drives economic growth. And so when the trade, the tariffs, the trade war started biting China and, and, and uh, causing a shortage of dollars because you need dollars to buy food, energy, and raw materials for manufacturing because they can't buy with an RMB. People won't take RMB on the international uh, financial scene because they don't trust it. They need dollars. So where do they get the dollars? Well, trade's squeezing them on dollars, so they put pressure on MSCI to increase the weighting of Chinese equities from all the way up to 20%, which means $400 billion go into China over the next year. Where does that money come from? It comes from your retirement funds. Now, the interesting thing about this, and there's an article actually by the uh, Wall Street Journal editorial board lamenting people talking about, well, we shouldn't be sending the money to the Chinese Communist Party because it actually forces them to abide by U.S. accounting and transparency rules. So the editorial board of the Wall Street Journal was not aware that we actually allow Chinese equities to be registered and listed in America without abiding by audit and transparency requirements that every other uh, U.S. And, and, and international corporation is required to abide by. So your $400 billion of your retirement money is going over to China, and you don't know what you're getting. And I'll tell you what you're getting. You're, you're paying for the Belt and Road Initiative. You're paying, paying for Made in China 2025. And you're paying for, and get this, uh, weapons. Now, what's the most egregious um, part of the story? The Federal Thrift Savings Board, the board that handled my retirement as, a, as an active duty member, just voted to do the same thing. So now military members, I'm a V2 pilot, are going to have their retirements invested in the weapons that they may fa be facing someday. I mean, if you want to think about something preposterous, that's really preposterous. So it's not only that it's not transparent and you don't have the same audit requirements, we are investing in the manufacturer aviation, in uh, aviation uh, investment, or Aviation Industry Corporation of China, AVIC, the company that makes the J-20 and a lot of the other weapons that, that we may face. And, quite frankly, the Navy faces on a day-to-day -day basis in the South China Sea. So if you want to know what's going on with national security, you know, I, I encourage you to read the book because there's a lot more in there. And you'll come away, um, I think, better informed about how the world works, at least in terms of trade and investment and finance. But you also come away with a, a sense of the capability that we have as a nation to turn this around. We have the capital, we have the talent. Today in the United States, we have some of the lowest energy rates in the OECD, lowest corporate tax rates, deregulation, there's opportunity zones everywhere, but yet we can't get manufacturing to come back to the United States because, number one, we won't spend any of our government money to incentivize it, and number two, we allow the capital to go out to build the manufacturing capacity of China. These are all choices that we have. It's not, it's not rocket science. We have everything that we need to basically take our GDP from a horizontal run to a vertical run and watch China's go horizontal because at the end of the day, their model is no different than the Soviet Union. It's just that they take our innovation, technology, talent, and capital, repackage it in Chinese Communist Party ideology, and re-export it to the world. So um, with that, I'll, I'll take your questions. I'm uh, Peter Humphrey, an intelligence analyst, a former diplomat. The big puzzle to me is the fact that there's zero chance of this getting any better. Um, and that, when you realize that, as most of us, I think, do, you make a decision to start the campaign against this. That decision was made about 1950 against the Soviet Union and succeeded about four years later. But I see nothing to begin the campaign now. No secret NSC committee to start arranging covert operations. No attempt to break the uh, Great Wall uh, uh, censorship system, which is really the only thing you have to do. If you have faith in mankind that people with a full information set will make better choices, then all you have to do is break the hold on information. 
And Lord knows we have the technology to do that. But I see zero start. What's going on here? Yeah, and I would say, um, you know, I wasn't I wasn't alive back in the early '50s when you know the the Iron Curtain was coming down. We were realizing what uh, the challenge the Soviet Union was going to bring. Um, so I think you know, in a free country, there's there's a process of dialogue that has to happen. There's a process of, of understanding that has to take place. Quite frankly, that's why, uh, you know, I could have continued in the Air Force. Nobody was forcing me out. Um, but I felt it was important for us to start this dialogue. So that's what the book's about. It's about having, you know, it's a call to arms. It's about exactly what you're saying. We're either going to fight for this democracy or we're going to lose it. And we're going to lose it, and I see it every, every uh, losing an inch every single day. Unless we fight for it, you know, it, it won't stay there forever. It's not, there's a few times in, in, in the history of mankind that we've had societies where you could reach your full potential. This is one of them. And we're watching, with what happened with the NBA, that's just a small sliver of what's going on. We're losing it. And we need to stand up and, and fight for it. And, and so when somebody says, well, we shouldn't have tariffs because it's going to affect my business, and you say, well, you know, how about, how about, we need to actually think about what our connection to this uh, totalitarian regime means for us economically, but not just economically, what it means for our freedom. You know, if uh, in, in April I, was, I got to walk the factory floor of a, of a thousand person factory that shut down overnight in uh, central Pennsylvania, in a county of 20,000. Okay, so this, this factory. Uh, provided about almost a billion dollars of economic activity for that county of 20,000 people and employed a thousand. So overnight, and it was pressured, by the way, by uh, Chinese dumping, furniture dumping. Overnight, that factory closed. So the federal government or the state government or whatever local government was responsible now for the health benefits of a of a thousand people and the retirement benefits, but more importantly, that billion dollars of economic activity, that small county of 20,000 people was gone. I tell people, and I told people when I was in the White House, look at Dresden after the 8th Air Force got done with it. Bombed out, bombed out in, uh, um, neighborhoods. Now, do you think that the Germans knew who was doing that? Absolutely. They could see the planes going overhead. They knew who was bombing them. But go look at Detroit today. Same thing, overhead photos. Bombed out neighborhoods. It's gone. It's gone. But the people didn't understand what was happening to them because, quite frankly, we didn't tell them. You know, so, so now you're armed with kind of some ideas of what the, what the challenge is, and it's time to, to stand up and say, we're going to do something different. We don't have to just keep going the way that we've been going. And, and I agree with you. You know, I, I'm frustrated with you. I'm frustrated with, you know, the our entire corporate sector in Wall Street saying we've got to have a deal with the Chinese. At what cost? At the cost of our own freedom? Because that's what's at stake. Uh, your prediction on Hong Kong and how that's going to finally resolve itself. So um, that's, we actually had the Chinese just meet uh, in a plenary, and they said exactly what's going to happen. And if you go back and read the Tiananmen Papers, they'll tell you the three lessons they learned out of uh, the Tiananmen Massacre is, number one, the Chinese Communist Party is under attack from the United States in league with people in China. Number two, we need this globalization. We absolutely have to have it, but we have to drive the ideology into the depths of our society in order to protect them from getting root of this democratic principles. And three... If the Communist Party is ever separated from uh, the people, then we will fail. Okay, so that's what drives the Great Firewall and, and, and enforced indoctrination and everything else. And unless we break through that, you know, we have to understand what, we're, what we face. Uh, I'm interested in your thoughts on what the business sector's role in all of this is, because despite everything that's going on, you still see companies investing private companies investing in China, uh, even though the regulations in China are starting to move against them, like the cybersecurity law that's coming into effect <coughs> on January 1st. So I'm coming from the NGO sector, and I see a complete mirror of what happened to the NGO sector for the last 20 years, slowly, slowly regulating to death until you, 
you get to the point with the INGO law and the charity law where the Chinese government has been able to cherry pick what organizations it wants to have stay in the country and either co-opt or kill off the other ones that it sees as being threatening to its monopoly on power. And businesses seem to be sort of falling into that same trap. So sort of what would your advice to them be? So um, first of all, we can't expect businesses to be governments. In other words, they don't, you know, AT&T doesn't wake up and say, I need to worry about the national security of the United States. They just don't. They wor worry about uh, fiduciary responsibility of their shareholders. That's what our system says. So, but we have to think about some of the some of the things that are contributing to, to that kind of behavior. So, if you're in China right now and you have uh, money in a in an account in a bank account, you know we have a thing in an accounting standards called level one assets, right? So, level one assets are like money in the bank in the United States. And so, if you're making profits in China, but those profits can't come out because it's got a non-convertible currency and strict capital controls, yet our accounting system let you count that just like you had money in the bank in the United States. Well, your corporate officers get paid more, they get bonuses, right? Your directors get more, they get bonuses, the stock price goes up. But what are you getting, gaining in terms of actual value that the shareholder can, can actually put their hands on? So this is, we do this to ourselves. And so if you want to incentivize a system to do things that are actually in the national interest, you have to change the system so the incentives are, are, are built in the proper way. This is what China figured out, right? Get private interests aligned with Communist Party interests and then everything is easy. Not just in China, everywhere. If I can get people aligned with what we want to do, either because I'm making them rich or because um, you know they really want to get into a, a market of 1.4 billion Chinese, then I don't have to work very hard to convince you that you should keep that system going, right? When she goes to Davos and says, we need globalization, he's not saying, I agree with you, um, Winston Churchill and, and the FDR. He's saying, keep the system open so I can keep tapping it because I need it. I need it so we have to have consistent growth in our economy because our social contract is we will deliver that to the Chinese people and they will forget about freedom of speech and freedom of religion and freedom from oppression. That will not change until they don't have access to the innovation, technology, talent, and capital of the West to drive that engine in a, in, a, in a positive direction. Then the people will start to ask, okay, what are we trading here? Thank you. Uh, thank you for publishing this amazing book, a very comprehensive and detailed at the same time. I, think, I believe everyone concerned about CCP should read this book as a common knowledge. Um, and in chapter 10, I, I think China has been really good at psychological warfare, and also China is, uh, I believe, into uh, CCP or the Communist Party uh, is, has been infiltrating the American education system because, uh, for example, uh, one third, <coughs> one third of the millennials uh, think favorably uh, of communists. I, I think it's the influence of, I believe, of CCP. So do, do you have any? Well, so um, first of all, let's deal with um, the data model that we have currently. The data model is really shared by both China's system and our system, and actually we created, we created the data model. That's the data model that drives Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, and Google. It's this idea of, of a, a data space that, where there is no such concept as, as private property. In other words, um, you don't own your data. Nobody owns your debt. In, in many ways, if you think about this in a, in a historical sense in the United States, it's very much like the Wild West. You know, prior, prior to the time we sent the U.S. Marshals in, and prior to the time when we settled the West, it was pretty much a lawless place. Now, we built that technological foundation because we never understood what the Internet could be in the beginning. And so the idea in page 19 of the National Security Strategy is let's reset the data model. Let's build a nationwide secure Internet for the American people and that goes back to the, the preamble of the Constitution, provide for the common defense. So if, um, if you're not worried about somebody coming in and bombing you because we've got an Air Force, 
uh, or being invaded because of Army and uh, Marine Corps or coming from the sea because we have a Navy. But you are concerned because you really can't prevent nation states from getting in and taking your data. And, and more importantly, that data can be used in, in ways that are, e are used to, to counter your interests and the national interests of the United States. Whose responsibility is, is it for protecting that data? Thanks so much, because, you know, I, I listened to that speech at the Hudson Institute uh, at dinner, um, and, you know, first of all, I said, great, he's summarizing my book. <laughs> and second of all, I said, exactly. It is a communist party. It's a Chinese communist party. This is a regime that is no different than Stalin's uh, regime. It's no different than Hitler's regime. It's the same type of regime. We've seen this play out again and again. They just do a very good uh, job of hiding it. And quite frankly, because we're compensated, whether you're working for corporate America or Wall Street or, you know, when I was in the White House calling law firms or think tanks looking for help in either in terms of policy recommendations or to expose what China was doing, you know, what they told me was, sorry, can't help you. We don't want to anger our Chinese funders or um, our Chinese customers. And so um, we have to, you're exactly right, call a spade a spade. In this case, we... Um, we uh, tend to not do that in, in, uh, in dip diplomatic circles. In fact, we're going around Asia right now in, in, in the defense part and talk, talking about how the Chinese Communist Party isn't the problem. This is not going to be helpful because our allies and partners need to know what's the, what's the challenge we face. The challenge we face is not the Chinese people. You're right. It's not. It's, it's corporate America, but it's corporate, corporate America in league with the Chinese Communist Party, who's designing the incentive system that powers that, and so you know, I was uh, I was extremely uh, grateful to hear that speech. I thought I, I actually recommend any everybody listen to that. It's 15 to 20 minutes long, but it lays out I think in the in the in the purest terms yet. And I think you know it also shows that your government is actually engaged in a lot of ways in this fight. But this is a whole nation fight. You know, and the, and, the, and the society is not behind it, right? We're sitting here, and I remember, you know, um, when I was trying to try to uh, educate my uh, National Security Council um, colleagues about the, the challenge, one of the things I did was we had a series of informal, and I talk about this in the book, informal dialogues on, um, on oh, I called it the Winning Without War series. So it was about um, uh, political warfare, uh, lawfare, psychological warfare, all the things that, that uh, the IWP talks about to show how you can undermine a, a, an enemy from within, particularly if it's a stronger enemy. And I remember at the, that fir very first meeting, you know, we had 40, just like this, 45 minutes of dialogue, then 20 minutes of Q&A, and then, and then it was 45 minutes of just free-for-all. Well, during the free-for-all session, somebody called, you know, somebody else in the room a panda hugger. 
and <laughs> all hell broke loose. And so, you know, they, they were screaming at each other, yelling at each other. So I got up at the end, you know, and I wanted to continue to do this, but I thought it was helpful dialogue. And I said, look, you know, first of all, the enemy's not in this room. It's 6,000 miles away, number one. Number two, we're all drunk on China. We're all alcoholics. It's time that we all raise our hand and said, we all bought into this. It didn't work. And what are we going to do collectively to get out of it? Because we are not going to solve this by, you know, throwing things at each other. We have to work together to get over this. And this is the most significant existential threat to democracy in the history of the modern, you know, since the United States was formed. Clearly. It's inside the, you know, we, we, in the military terms, it's inside the wire. Right? We're taking casualties right now in our own homeland. Not, you know, we think about fighting far away. We're fighting today for, for a democracy right here in America. Uh, China's um, facing a demographic challenge with a rapidly aging population. How do you think that's going to impact the Communist Party strategy? I think, it, I think it's actually um, um, built into Made in China 2025. So how do you deal with a declining um, you know, uh, labor population, labor pool? It's automation. It's about artificial intelligence. It's about big data. It's about robotics. All of that's built into Made in China 2025. So what they're going to seek to do is, is increase their productivity of their um, – and, and really what they were trying to do, and quite frankly what I thought they would have trouble doing until I understood more of, the, of their plans – is to transition from a low value added economy to a high value added economy. So how are they doing that? Well, they're offloading manufacturing capacity to um, Southeast Asia and Africa and Central Asia, and they're trying to build up their capability in semiconductors and, and you know quantum computing and all these other you know advanced um, bio um, technologies that we currently dominate. And so you know that's how, um, in my uh, opinion, they're going to deal with that. Every time that, that somebody says um, China's got a challenge, they are focused on pragmatically solving those challenges. They don't, you know, it's funny, my Defense Department colleagues will say, well, how do we deter them? How do we, sh let's show them a capability and they'll be, and, you know, they, they won't, you know, that, that'll terrify them and they won't want to challenge us. No, that just gives them, an, you know, another thing that they need to go and solve. They don't think of things in terms like we do, in terms of time. You know, we, we have a goal in the West, and we're like, well, I'm gonna, in three years, I'm going to be here. They have a goal, and they put a mark out in the future, and they just find out what are the strategic trends I need to, you know, essentially uh, mold myself to, to take advantage of. Globalization, the Internet. Let's just let the clock play out. These guys over here in the West, they're gonna they're gonna get distracted short term thinking. Now, can we do long term strategy? Absolutely, we did the Cold War. It was fundamentally the same strategy from the from the initiation all the way through to the end. So we can do long term foreign policy and strategy. We've done it in this country, um, and we can do it again. My question for you, and I'm sorry to bring it up, seems like you've gotten it a lot from other personnel and DOD, but what? What can we do from the military aspect, um, obviously below the level of um, comfort? Mm. So, um, the, so if you think of Clausewitz, war is politics by other means, show many, apply mass at the weakest point, do hay, do it with an airplane, you know, I'm an Air Force guy. Uh, compare that to Sun Tzu, which is really the art of war, which is not really about war, it's about how do you defeat your enemy without actually having the risk of war. Mao's people wars, how, how you take politics and make it not war as politics by other means, but politics is war by other means, right? And then how you deploy that um, using um, the Belt and Road Initiative and Made in China 2025 when you have this technology layer, 5G, which allows you to have all the data, and then Baidu, Alibaba, and Tencent, which allows you to have profit and control. And so when you, when you look at all those things and you say, okay, what, what's the de Depart Department of Defense role in this? Well, first of all, we're spending $800 billion a year in defense. But it's not getting any more countries in the UN to actually vote with us. What are they voting about? They're voting about the Port of Piraeus. They're voting about um, the Port of Hambantota. They're voting about 
things that are actually going to improve the, the lot of their, of their people, and we're spending all our money on weapons. So what I would advocate is there's two things in the Defense Department. There's Title III and there's the Defense Production Act. They have all, the Defense Department, more than any other department or agency in the U.S. government, has the tools, the authorities to do industrial policy. If we don't want the Chinese to make circuit boards for F-35s, then the Defense Department can make that happen. During World War II, we nationalized the steel and rubber industries because we needed to. Now, I'm not saying that we have to be that drastic, but we certainly can take some of that $800 billion and focus it in STEM, in R&D, in industrial base, and in infrastructure. You know, the Eisenhower National Highway System was ostensibly for national security because we connected Air Force bases to the highway system. Now, of course, I think, you know, that was, uh, that was uh, probably done with a grin back in the day, but guess what? It got a national highway system built, right? All, all I was looking for when I was in the White House was a digital highway for the American people that would protect them from the predations of China and other uh, uh, totalitarian regimes. So, by the way, that can be done by uh, DOD if they chose to. Build a military network for, for the military and then share it with the American people, right? Because 5G allows you to do that. You can bond, uh, uh, 4G allows you to bond tw uh, f five 20 megahertz channels for a total pipe of 100 megahertz. 5G is 500 megahertz. That's more than enough capacity for all the data that U.S. produces every single year. So, so you mentioned relocation of labor to Africa. Apart from cheap labor and natural resources, what other play do you see in Africa? Oh, so I mean, actually, there's there's a great um, study by McKinsey that you know they wanted us to partner with uh, with China in Africa. And really, it's, it's really about connecting China to the resources of Africa. So you need cobalt, right, to make lithium-ion batteries. Where does that come? Dem Democratic Republic of Congo. What do you do? You build, a, you build a mine in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Then you build a port out in Djibouti, right? And then you connect it with the rail, road, telecommunications, power, water. Now what do you have? You have the skeletal system of an industrialized society. What do you become, bring in next? Low-value-added manufacturing. What comes next? Urbanization. Now you have all the pieces to install cameras with artificial intelligence, cell phones with, uh, with apps. So they're building $50 smartphones to sell to Africans. So they're in, within a generation, you can take, you can take uh, these countries from you know, essentially backwaters to a developed uh, IT-based authoritarian society. And that, that's what they're doing. And so they're creating a, a permanent connection to China in terms of, hey, we got access to the resources, but also I've built myself a, a, a made in China market. Where are the apps that these guys have? WeChat. All right. So there's, um, there is good goodness in a lot of the ways that China looks at this problem because it's about building, not breaking. But also there's badness in that, you know, the principles that underlie what they're doing is I don't care who the authoritarian is. I'll hand you the keys to be the best authoritarian that you want to be. I'll make you even better. And so that's the piece that, you know, when you look at USAID, when you look at TDA, when you look at OPEC, when you look at XM, what are the values of those? We want to destroy them. When you look at U.S. Information Agency, which the, Dr. Lenchowski would talk to me all the time about, you know, an, an independent agency to do public diplomacy. All of these things that we had during the Cold War for, you know, what was the Marshall Plan? It was about preventing the spread of, of, of totalitarianism into, the, into um, Western Europe. So we used to know how to do this. And, you know, what, what I would hope is that a lot of our uh, bureaucrats uh, today would limber up their arms, you know, wisen up their brains and begin to build and not break. I think that's all the questions. So it's, it's been a great honor. And, and, and uh, Dr. Lenchowski, I appreciate so much you, the opportunity to come here and speak today. And I'm um, happy to speak to you offline when this is all said and done. Have a good day.